right, so I'm Sati Molyneux, I'm a social scientist, and I have been invited by Mike to co-lead the Health Systems Collaborative with him. Um, like many of uh, the speakers that we've heard so far, I've actually also moved back from overseas, and I was actually proud to notice that I have spent more years in Kenya than both of you have in March. Um, that's one for me. Uh, but um, I'm going to be basically giving an overview of the Health Systems Collaborative, and I'm going to be um, doing this together with um, Shobi and with Al. Uh, we're just going to tell you a little bit about the group and give you some illustrations of some of the research that we do. So, like many other of the groups that we've already heard from, we um, link scientists based here in Oxford um, with scientists from a range of other different LMICs. But the focus of our work is to conduct research that's aimed at strengthening the health systems that are so crucial to getting out new innovations and developments in healthcare to the people who need it. And a really core concern of ours is to build capacity, our own capacity and the capacity of others in applied multidisciplinary research. Um, some of you may have attended a series of Global Health Challenge um, webinars that we held uh, online last year, bringing together people from many different places, focusing on a, key, a couple of key global health challenges. We're really grateful for that. And they're online in case anybody would like to see broader examples of our, of our work, and let me know if you want to hear more about that. Um, something that we're also doing to help build our own capacity and others is holding a whole series of skills building sessions that are organized by our DFILs on various methodological elements of, um, of doing multidisciplinary research. So um, you're very welcome if you're not already joining that to, to do so, and again, get in touch with any of us in our group. So who are we? Um, this is uh, a mugshot of many of us uh, who are based here in Oxford. Uh, and as you'll see by the, the names, um, we bring together uh, a range of different disciplines across the clinical and social sciences. Uh, and we're really lucky to have managerial support from um, Holly and from Francis, which is fantastic. We have a, a wonderful group of DPhil students based here in Oxford, and um, many of them are actually really excited that they're going to be presenting their work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can I ask those of you who are here to stand up for a moment? <laughs> Yeah, they were just telling me they're really kind of excited. So most of the people students are based here uh, in our in, in NDM, but we also have two Kai and Rita um, who are based in the Department of Population Health, and we co-supervise together with colleagues at the Kemri Medical Research Institute, um, uh, Kenyan uh, PhD students who are based there as well. So um, between us all, we do a, a range of different studies, some small, some larger, that fit into these broad um, themes outlined here. Um, and many of the studies that we do cross these different themes. And I'm going to just give an example of one of the big programs of work that we're currently doing that brings together many people in our group uh, and that crosses those different themes. So this project is called HiQ. It's an NIHR-funded health systems research grant. And the PIs are Mike English and Professor Wen, um, Fred Waring, who's based in Kenya. And this program of work brings together Oxford Kemri Wellcome Trust and Capricorn, which is the Kenya Pediatric Research Consortium. So at the heart of the HiQ project is a recognition that if you have new technologies, new innovations, um, just dropping them into complex health systems without any other changes, often doesn't achieve the kind of impacts on quality of care, patient outcomes that are hoped for. And in fact, they can often be, given the complexity of health systems, unintended negative uh, implications from introducing those innovations. So our main um, uh, research question or objective around HiQ is to understand how technological and human resource interventions can be designed and implemented in ways that actually enhance quality of inpatient and post-discharge care. And our focus is on neonatal care, given that there's such a huge opportunity to reduce um, mortality uh, and poor outcomes in neonates. And the focus of our work is in Kenya. So part of the HiQ uh, initiative in, involves 
trying to understand how an existing bundle of new technologies in newborn units, how they're impacting on the health workforce. And in four um, public uh, hospitals, large public hospitals, we're also trying to um, look at the impact of introducing additional nursing staff and ward assistants into neonatal care units and looking at how that impacts on nursing care. So we've got four big uh, packages of work. One looks at the impact of these types of, uh, of these interventions that I've just mentioned and looking at that both quantitatively and qualitatively. We have another work package which focuses on the post-discharge um, care space. So looking at whether new tools are needed uh, and if so, how those new tools might incorporate health worker and family needs, uh, including through co-designing those new tools with the people who are ultimately going to use them. And then we have another work package which is looking at regulations and governance of technologies and how this impacts on the use of those technologies and their oversight and practice with a focus on um, medical devices. And a cross-cutting area of work um, is looking, is conducting process evaluations of each of these sets of interventions and how they layer on top of each other in order to understand if there's an impact or not, what's the what's and the why's behind that impact. So a big program of work like this always um, comes on top of uh, long histories of collaborations and ongoing work. Uh, an important one here is the next NEST 360 program, um, which is, has brought in a bundle of um, essential newborn technologies into hospitals in quite a few different countries in Africa, including the four hospitals in which we're doing the focused high cube work. So that means that we don't have to actually introduce those uh, technologies ourselves. They're already in place and we're doing research to see how they're impacting. And another big platform of collaborations and work that we're building on is the uh, clinical information network that was initiated by, um, by Mike and Fred and colleagues. And it's been ongoing since 2013 and I think now has 21 <laughs> hospitals uh, involved in it within Kenya. And the idea here is to, to work with the hospitals and, and the managers and the staff to strengthen the routine data that's collected uh, and to be able to feed back performance uh, and outcome data back to those hospitals so that that can help to strengthen the quality of care. But how that's helpful for research, including HiQ, is that that data is also available for research and we're able in HiQ to leverage that data in order to look at the impact of the interventions I described. And those platforms are part of a wider set of community and, um, and stakeholder engagement that's so essential for interventions and research programs like this uh, to help us make sure that the research is as relevant and impactful as possible. Uh, and so we have a careful community engagement plan laid out and that's responsive to issues and new stakeholders as they um, as they come up over time, which includes um, involvement of um, parental group representation. Um, so the Premi Love group there uh, is a parents group which helps to advise uh, in this study. So that HiQ project is just one illustration of um, the kind of work that we do that brings many of us together. Um, in this slide, I'm just showing um, in terms of my own interests, a lot of the work that I do um, could fall under umbrella, an umbrella of applied social science research. Um, and in fact, the HiQ project, which I'm centrally involved in, is a good example um, of a project that falls across these three overlapping areas of interest that a lot of my work falls in. But just to give you two additional examples, I've had a long um, history of doing research with managers and with collaborators in South Africa and Kenya, trying to understand how health system resilience can be built uh, to the kinds of chronic shocks and acute stresses that systems have to deal with. So staff shortages, staff strikes, uh, um, inadequate other resources, and then uh, an epidemic or a flood on top of that. How are health systems coping? How can they come transform positively? And how can they also at the same time maintain their requirement to be responsive to patients and to publics? And just to mention in terms of ethics and practice, uh, 
here the interest is not so much how the rules and the regulations and, and, um, and, and how they're constructed, but more for the people who are actually doing the work on the ground, for the frontline staff in health systems, for the frontline research data collectors. What are the kinds of ethics dilemmas and issues that they face in their daily work? Um, how do we, uh, higher up in systems and as research leads, support uh, these frontline staff? And how can we strengthen those support processes, including through improving our public and broader community engagement strategies? So that's just, um, if anybody's interested in any of these areas, very happy to talk more about them. Um, and Sebastian has asked me just to share uh, an illustration of some work that he's involved with. So Sebastian is actually a really senior social scientist who's been coordinating the whole of high Q. He let me know yesterday he wouldn't be coming to present all of this today, but I'm going to So I reduced his own slides to two <laughs> on his additional interest, which is in point of care tests for uh, sexually transmitted infections. So it, it's pretty incredible that, as well as coordinating all of that work that I've just described on the IQ, he's also taking forward his, his own interest in this area. I think um, many of you will be very aware that this is a huge problem in terms of the numbers of new cases globally and on a daily basis and the impacts uh, of these cases, not only on things like AMR, but also for the individuals in terms of onwards to feline. Um, so there is very good evidence for um, STI post of care tests to improve clinical outcomes, but unfortunately they're rarely implemented into care. There is a model of, in, uh, of implementation um, that's been developed for use in NHS England that involves a co-creation process, um, working with stakeholders to evolve, um, to evolve the implementation and, and embed it into systems. And Sebastian has submitted a proposal together with collaborators uh, and the WHO to modify and evaluate this, this approach. Uh, in Ecuador and in Zambia, and he's been doing that using a realist evaluation approach. Um, so if you want to hear more about that work, um, feel free to contact him. Um, um, and then I'm going to now just hand over to um, Shobi, who's going to give some more examples, or an example of research. <laughs> Hi everybody, um, my name is Shobi and I'm a clinical researcher based in the Health Systems Collaborative Group and I work mainly in the field of implementation science, um, doing a few projects here in the UK around um, childhood malnutrition in Oxford um, and with the hospital, but mainly working in India around two main areas which are preterm birth and climate nutrition and health. Um, and um, preterm birth, for anyone who's not aware of us, it um, affects about 15 million babies every year. It's a leading cause of neonatal mortality. And the burden really falls on lower middle income countries, in particular South Asia and Sub Saharan Africa. Um, and the communities that are really hardest to reach, those living in really rural areas, are the ones that don't really get timely care or have that um, level of care in hospitals. Um, so we're working very closely with grassroots organisations and NGOs um, in two different areas of India, Kerala in the south of India and um, Uttarakhand, which is in the Himalayan region, um, right in the north of India as well. Um, so just to give you a bit of um, an overview of the types of um, context that we're working across, um, together with the Leomir Foundation and their partners um, who are based in these very rural areas, um, we're working in the mountains um, across urban settlements um, in slums around um, fishing villages in Kerala and also in the jungles, um, which I had the pleasure of visiting um, earlier this year and um, trying to reach families in these areas can be quite challenging. Um, and so as the, this is sort of just at the um, very first stages of the work, but we started off doing a landscape analysis to look at the major global stakeholders involved in preterm birth and identify those areas where we can really have an impact for these rural communities. And then the second part of this work has been with the focal geographies, actually focusing on um, the grassroots organisations working in these areas, developing their theories of change and thinking about how they might evaluate their programmes effectively so they can have self-sustaining methods of funding as well for themselves. And this has mainly been in the two areas of India that I've um, talked about, but also across Indonesia with a partner organisation that works across all the islands. Um, so hopefully we'll get, get to visit them very soon. Um, and just to sort of, um, highlight a few of the challenges that we're facing when we're developing models of care for babies born in these settings, 
Um, sometimes people say data doesn't tell a story, but I think this slide really tells a story, um, which is um, in this region of the Himalayas, the nearest villages I've circled them um, on this slide. Um, they look quite geographically close to each other, but it takes about three to five hours to get in between each of these locations. The nearest hospital is a four to eight hour drive away and doesn't have a neonatal intensive care unit, doesn't even have a paediatrician. Um, so um, this slide um, with the data on it shows that over a thousand babies were born um, in an 18 month period within the ambulance, um, which is actually staffed by um, just drivers who don't have any medical background. And um, so some of the challenges that we face when we're thinking about delivering effective care in these um, settings is about how we can um, implement things that can actually, um, for example, getting women down the mountain in time to have birth near the hospital or thinking about training the ambulance staff and those kind of challenges that we're facing as well. <clears throat> um, so the other aspect of the work in India that I've been doing has been around a small pump priming award, which is awarded to a few of us in the HSE team, and I'm looking after the India side of things, um, working together with partners, um, one called NEDPRO, who's um, the a Global Institute for Food and Nutrition and Health Research, and also IORA and Vertiver, who do the state national and, and, and national action plans for climate change in India. And 70% of the Indian population live in rural areas, <laughs> um, rural areas, and um, their livelihoods directly depend on climate. And so we've held two roundtable meetings in September, and we're just pulling together all the findings of that into a white paper at the moment. Um, so thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Al. <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm, this slide is, is by a colleague, a colleague of ours, um, Atakrit at Lake Civilize. Um, he's not here today. He's working in two areas, models and decision aid tools for health workforce planning. Um, and that work is geared towards suggesting potential gaps in future research needed, um, particularly to incorporate task sharing, task shifting. The reason why he's not here today is because he's um, submitting an application to NIHR within the next hour. <laughs> um, and that, that work is on physician associates. Um, and answering the question, how might physician associates help or not to address um, the workforce crisis in the NHS? So that's adequate. Fingers crossed there for him. Um, on to my work. I'm conscious not much time left. Um, my work is mainly in public community and stakeholder engagement. Over the last two years, a lot of my work has been involved with, with COVID-19 trials. I lead a, a public, uh, sorry, I, I lead a, a WHO um, technical working group for COVID-19 or GPP with, with COVID-19 um, vaccine trials. Um, I'm also, I've also worked on a piece of work for the WHO Global Health Ethics and Governance Use um, Unit, looking at ethics and adaptive trials, I think particularly in the, in the um, consent and community engagement area. I also do, do um, um, I'm also working on a training for NIHR for, for community engagement and involvement. Um, last slide. Um, we're currently, I think for the next year or so, the main focus of my work will be on scoping out a new MSc in Global Health Intervention and Programme Evaluation. Um, to date, that work has involved consultations within the group to map out what we can offer um, from, from our group, um, and also consultations uh, with collaborators in LMIC to work out what the demand is, what, what kind of areas they, they want in, in such a course, and also um, benchmarking um, against what's on offer out there um, within Oxford itself in terms of masters, but also in other leading, leading uh, universities. And yeah, that's it for us. Brilliant.